Okay, part two of the video. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, corporations being on uh, four sort of levels of social responsibility. So what is social responsibility? Um, so it's basically an attitude that organizations take towards their five stakeholder groups, right? Um, on the lowest level of social responsibility, you have companies who take an obstructionist stance. Obstructionist, and what is it that we are obstructing or blocking? And that's the law. These are companies that will lie and cheat and steal and cook the books. Um, if they can get away with it, they will break the law, um, whether or sometimes they can't get away with it, um, but they will do that. Companies that take a defensive stance, these are those companies that will do what the law tells them they have to do, um, what regulation says that they have to do. Maybe um, the law says we can't discriminate against certain groups of people. Maybe the law says we have to practice a certain level of environmentalism. Um, and so companies will follow that law, but not a damn thing more. Companies that take an accommodative stance will go above and beyond for some of the five stakeholder groups. Um, one example I always like to talk about is uh, the Container Store. It was just in there the other day. And a company like the Container Store, they're based here in the DFW area, they have a phenomenal reputation about treating employees well. Um, they pay well above minimum wage and they offer a really comprehensive number of benefits and they always land on like these top 100 places to work lists. That's an example of a company that takes an accommodative stance. They go above and beyond for some of the stakeholder groups in this example, employees as a stakeholder group. Companies that take a proactive stance really do good. Um, they, they offer high levels of social responsibility really to benefit all five stakeholder groups, employees, the community, um, investors, uh, the uh, obviously the consumer, and then also suppliers, okay? So these are companies like Google that tend to have really positive reputations for you know, the way that they treat all of those stakeholders. Okay, I wanna just talk quickly about three areas of social responsibility that companies really today are focusing on. One is responsibility towards the consumer, the idea of consumerism, of protecting the consumer. This concept dates back really to JFK. Um, JFK was the creator of JFK's Consumer Bill of Rights. And the Consumer Bill of Rights, you have to appreciate, came at a time when companies really could lie about um, you know, what their product was made out of, where it was sourced, country of origin, the care, um, and really there were no regulations about companies disclosing the harm that their products could do. If you think about today, like cigarettes, you know, really well labeled um, on, on cartons and individual packets that this product will kill you. That really dates back to JFK's Consumer Bill of Rights. The idea that the consumer has the right to be safe and to be informed about a product. Um, laws like the Fair Care Packaging and Labeling Act were updated as a result of JFK's Consumer Bill of Rights. Um, the Food and Drug Administration, a lot of uh, labeling requirements comes you know, really from JFK's Consumer Bill of Rights. So that's the idea of consumerism, a social movement focusing on the consumer. Another big social movement is on the community, and this, is, this involves companies donating uh, sums of money or time, um, partnerships with um, you know, non-thropic or philanthropic, or, sorry, non-profit or philanthropic endeavors. Um, we think about examples like Ronald McDonald's Children's House, where Ronald Mc, the McDonald's Corporation is building housing facilities for the families of sick children so that they can come and visit a city and, and afford to be there while the child uh, in go, uh, undergoes uh, medical treatment. And if you think about it, some of these companies do this type of thing because um, it looks good from a public relations standard, right? We as consumers feel better about buying their products and services because we attach some type of kind of good, warm, fuzzy feeling with what, uh, how these companies benefit their, their communities. But another thing you may not know is that sometimes when a company, a corporation commits a crime, the punishment is not that a person goes to jail, the punishment is that the corporation has to invest a certain amount of money in doing these philanthropic or socially responsible deeds. 
So sometimes you see a company doing well, and it's not because uh, doing good, and it's not because they want to do good. It's because a court is ordering them to do good. So that's that's the idea of like responsibility towards the consumer. And the third one, probably the biggest of all trends, is responsibility towards the environment. These are companies that are making a big deal out of reducing their uh, environmental footprint, about marketing sustainable uh, products or using sustainable materials um, in the operation of their organizations. This is a, a, a kind of a huge uh, theme in the last decade or so. Okay, transitioning to one other idea before we get to our last story, and that is the idea that just because we are aware of and accustomed to the ethical standards um, and the law in our country doesn't necessarily mean that that will translate to another country. In plain English, what we believe is right and wrong here isn't always necessarily constant in another country. One example is the idea of bribery. I mentioned earlier that as a buyer, um, I could not accept gifts from my vendors over a certain amount of money would be considered bribery. They put me in a position to you know, maybe cloud my judgment about how much money I'm spending with another company. You know, in Japan, the idea of presenting a pretty sizable expensive gift to a business partner is pretty standard mode of operation. Um, so here in the United States, we consider it bribery, it's unethical. You know, in another country, it's, it's just sort of looked at in a different way. So that's, that's kind of important that the idea of business ethics may vary depending on another country. Okay, our last case study, our last story of the lecture has to do with Enron. Enron was a Houston, Texas-based energy company. And there isn't one crime that I can pin Enron for. There was really many, many crimes. Um, one of the big crimes that Enron committed was accounting fraud, getting together with their accounting, public accounting firm, um, to get the public accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, to make their revenue look greater, bigger, and to make their debt look smaller. Um, and that really put a lot of questions in the mind of the public about how can we trust uh, publicly traded companies that we want to invest in if we cannot believe the financial records that they're issuing, right? Um, Arthur Anderson, an accounting firm, was lying about Enron's financial situation and about their debt. And they were actually selling their debt on paper to fake companies that were really just Enron. Um, the other thing that Enron did was they were manipulating the markets that they sold to. So if you don't know, Enron is, was an energy company. And one thing that Enron did to basically drum up more business for itself was to create blackouts. So they created rolling blackouts through um, the state of California. And as a basic law of supply and demand, when you withhold supply of something that's needed, it, act, it creates more demand for it and therefore prices go sky high. And that's basically what Enron did to boost its sales, um, was to kind of usher in these uh, rolling blackouts. I'm gonna show you two quick videos. One is a movie trailer, um, and it gives you sort of a Hollywood version of the Enron story. Uh, however, it's a really good movie. Um, it's called The Smartest Guys in the Room, and there's a lot of actual real footage from Enron, and it gives you a taste of the corporate culture of the company at, at, during this time. The other video is a news report that addresses more of the, the blackout situation, the manipulation of the actual product that Enron was selling and how it hurt consumers, okay? So let's watch the Hollywood trailer first. Give you a sense of what was going on um, culturally, corporate culture-wise, inside the company. It had taken Enron 16 years to go from about 10 billion of assets to 65 billion of assets. It took 24 days to go bankrupt. <laughs> We can add a gazillion dollars to the bottom line. Oh, right, that sounds fantastic. Did you convert stock worth $66 million? Uh, I don't know. I added approximately $100 million. Enron is a company that deals with everyone but with absolute integrity. So I got my compensation, and if I step on somebody's throat on the way, that doubles it, and I'll stomp on the guy's throat. 
The other thing about people at Enron is a lot of them were former nerds. You wanted to be the most popular guy on Wall Street, and you were going to do whatever you had to do. They sought out every loophole they could in order to profit. The rules weren't quite clear. They could bury debt, they could bury losses. An industry that was very reliable for 100 years was all of a sudden turned into a casino. Those guys could just make the California economy on its wish whenever they wanted to, and they did it, and they did it, and they did it. So I predict the energy crisis as a result of deregulation? Yes. But I predict that Trump is going to be a governor as a result of deregulation? Oh, I didn't expect that. How exactly does Enron make its money? The county doesn't get that created. I would like to know if you are on crack. This is the shredded evidence that came out of Enron. Everyone was on the bandwagon, and it can happen again. We are the good guys. We are on the side of angels. It has evolved to the corporate crime of the century. Okay, but here is that news report, actual news report, on the sort of phony energy crisis that Enron created. Remember the Enron tapes? Enron workers were heard manipulating the California energy shortage a few years back and gloating over it. Federal en energy regulators now say Enron made more than a billion and a half dollars off that shortage. And today, more audio and document surface. The first to indicate the scamming and scheming started years earlier than we previously knew. CBS's Vince Gonzalez gives you the inside story. During the West Coast power crisis, homes went dark and streetlights were out in California, causing injuries and accidents. But the danger didn't stop Enron's energy traders from having a good laugh. They had to do a rolling blackout through the town and there was a red light there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess they're causing, this is causing the animosity throughout the state now. Cars are blowing up. Newly released evidence shows years before the crisis, Enron schemed to manipulate markets. The new tapes, routinely recorded by Enron to protect their own deals and later obtained by this small utility in Washington State, confirm what CBS News has been reporting for four years. That Enron secretly shut down power plants so they could cause and then cash in on the crisis. I want you guys to get a little creative okay. and come up with a reason to go down. Plant operators were coached on how to lie to officials. Just call hey guys. Down. Okay, so we're just coming down for some maintenance, like a forced outage type of thing. Right. And that's cool. Hopefully. <laughs> Enron also pulled power out of states like California, causing emergency conditions to worsen. Sorry, California, but we're going to walk out of the city. Today, we got six over six hundred megawatts. The shutdowns and pullouts triggered sky high power prices. Where's the thinking? Money and, other and when states complain, let's get a little bit of money. Yeah, exactly. When the schemes began to unravel, employees blamed the men running Enron. I know the outfit. I just didn't know how much. That is for nothing, sir. Nothing happened. Ken Lay didn't But former CEO Ken Lay, in this Enron training tape obtained by CBS News, had a different message. Enron is a company uh, that deals with everyone but with absolute integrity. A federal grand jury didn't buy it. Lay has been indicted, and the tapes could be used against him. The company's spokesperson would only say Enron continues to cooperate with all ongoing investigations. Vince Gonzalez, CBS News, Los Angeles. Okay, so what did the United States government do to address the fact that Many, many public investors were completely duped. Um, one of the top four accounting firms in the United States went out of business as a result of the accounting fraud that, uh, that its client Enron committed. And so um, the federal government got together and created a massive sweeping overhaul of uh, accounting reform called SOX the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, okay? And SOX, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is known as Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act. And I just wanna cut that in half and explain to you the two sides of it. So public company, you need to understand what a public company is. That is any company that sells shares of its stock 
to investors on a public exchange. So any individual can buy a share of stock on, let's say, the New York Stock Exchange or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, okay? So this addresses public companies only, and it is hundreds of pages of new methods of accounting. And that's not at all what I wanna teach you because I'm not an accounting professor and you're not in an accounting class. But um, enough to understand that it is a massive overhaul um, for how public companies must conduct their accounting. But what I do want to talk about, and what is a final question on, one, on today's quiz for this lecture, is the Investor Protection Act. And this piece is actually pretty simple. So this law requires whoever is the chief financial officer of the company, whatever their title is, treasurer, senior vice president of finance, chief financial officer, whoever that person is, they have to do the same exact thing that you do at the bottom of your tax return when you file your taxes, whether you do it electronically or whether you do it on paper. And that is you sign your name. And when you sign your name, you're basically guaranteeing the financial accuracy in your case of your tax return. But in this case, when the chief financial officer signs off on any type of financial record that the company is going to issue to the public, that that CFO, that chief financial officer, is guaranteeing the financial accuracy with the penalty of jail. So all of a sudden now, corporations are people and people can go to jail if the company is committing any type of accounting or financial fraud. That's the beauty of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act because ultimately what it's trying to do is to protect the investor. No different from what we talked about insider trading before. The reason insider trading is illegal is because we're protecting the common investor. Um, and, and here, public companies have to issue honest financial statements in the interest of protecting you know, the, the regular investor who's trusting that when they read about the financial situation of a company that that information is true, okay? So that is the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and that is the last question on today's quiz. Now, I've got two quick things for you. One is, after you have reviewed my lecture and you've watched the videos, um, I would like for you to email me, and you can email me either through my Wade College email, jconti at wadecollege.edu, or you can message me on Jupiter. But I just wanna know from you, what was the most interesting part of the lecture today? and why, why did you find it interesting? Was it one of uh, the three uh, white collar crime stories I shared with you? Um, was it some other piece of the lecture? So what was the most interesting to you and why? The second thing I want you to do is to log on to Jupiter and to take your quiz. Um, this is chapter four, which is the ethic and social responsibilities chapter. Um, and please do make sure that you complete that quiz because um, it will close at the end of uh, at the end of our class meeting. Okay. Um, again, you've got this video, so you can review. You can take your time sending me an email to recap what the most interesting topic was, and then please complete your quiz once you feel ready um, with uh, the key the, the key concepts of this lecture. Okay. Hope you guys had a great July Fourth, and I will see you next week. Thank you.